Now, we're going to jump into our series. We actually have a new series that's coming up. Um, it's called Creating Margin. And to start off this series, I'm actually going to ask you a question. And you are going to talk to the person next to you. And it could be somebody you know, or it could be somebody you don't know. But what I'm going to ask you is please make sure that there is no one around you that doesn't have anybody to talk to. Okay? So everybody gets included in this question. It's an easy question. Don't worry. The question is, what is your favorite advancement that has happened in the past 200 years? Your favorite technology advancement, your favorite medical advancement, your favorite uh, uh, appliance that has been invented in the past 200 years. What's your favorite? All right, go. We're going to go ahead and bring it back, whole group. Now, there were some advancements that I overheard that I had not even thought of as advancements. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that too. I mean, there has been so much progress that has happened over the past 200 years. I mean, you could even limit it to 100 years. And there's so much that has happened in the medical community, in the entertainment community, in uh, cell phone, in technology, and in education. I mean, so many different things have happened and been developed. Now, the thing that's really interesting is that as all of those um, uh, advancements and inventions and everything had um, been created, there was kind of this idea that all of this progress and all of these advances in these different areas, there was this idea that that would actually lead to a life with more margin, a life with more space. Now, you might be thinking, like, what, what do you mean by margin? Well, originally, margin is actually a word that you, is used to describe, like, the white pages, the white space on a piece of paper, the white space that exists around a text. And the reason they use that margin is that when the text runs all the way to the edge, it's hard for your eye to follow what is happening. And that margin actually also creates sort of space for you to add comments or questions or edit changes as you're interacting with what is going on in front of you. Now, another way to describe margin in our lives is kind of like the white space. It's the space that we have in our lives or the space that we've created in our lives that allows us to reflect on what's going on, that allows us to actually think critically, to interact, to edit or make changes, to ask questions, to make comments and say, hey, I don't know that I like this piece so much. Margin is also understood as the space that is between our load, sorry, I couldn't read that word. <laughs> that margin is also the space between our loads and our limits. That there would actually be a distance between what we're totally capable of doing and carrying and what we are carrying. Uh, you could talk about margin as the space that allows for unanticipated challenges or unexpected events, like emergencies, like the car breaks down and that you would have space to deal with that. It's the gap between our schedules and our actual capacity. It's the gap that exists between a rest and exhaustion. Now, again, when all this progress was happening, people thought that this progress was going to lead to more margin in our lives, more gaps between our limits and our loads, 
more empty space for us to pause and reflect and think critically about life and what's happening to ask questions and um, reflect on what is going on. But what we found is that that's not the case at all. In fact, all of this advancement and all of this progress has not naturally created more margin. Instead, all of the advancement and all of the progress has also actually led us to strive for more progress. We keep going and doing in the pursuit of completing more, achieving more, driving more, accomplishing more, buying more, committing to more, expecting more, hurrying more, knowing more, watching more, listening to more, interacting more, working more, 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 more. We have become slaves to this pursuit of progress. All of the white space of our lives have just been washed away and completely filled with more stuff. We are overloaded, we are exhausted, we are overworked, we're frustrated, we are stressed out because we are living these marginalist lives. Now, Richard Swanson wrote this book, and it was called Margin, and it actually sets up the framework for the series that we're going to be um, talking about this month. And one of the things he talks about is he talks about how our society and people in our culture as a whole, we are so exhausted, and we live such marginless lives that we actually aren't even productive anymore. I mean, have you ever been there? You are so tired and so fatigued, you're trying to get something done, and it should just take you five minutes, but it's taking you a half an hour because you're so tired, you can't do it. And Swanson's whole thing is if you would just pause and take a break, if you would actually create some white space, if you would create some margin in your life, if you would rest, you would actually be more productive, but we don't see it that way. We are slaves to progress. And so we just keep beating ourselves and pushing ourselves and going and going and going more, 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 more. The other thing he says is he says that progress is strength is its ability to use tools like the economy and education and technology to make lives better. He says, but the problem is, is we don't see the weakness of progress. And the weakness actually sometimes outweighs the benefits. He says the weakness of progress is its inability to engage in relationships. That progress has this inability to develop our social lives, this inability to help us cultivate our emotional lives and engage in our spiritual lives. So in this quest to pursue project, oftentimes a progress, oftentimes we have to cut things out. For example, I mean, if you just think, Maybe you create daily or weekly a mental or physical to-do list. And you see that to-do list, and there is a ton of stuff on that to-do list. Eventually, you have to cut something out because chances are you're not going to be able to do all of those things. But it's really interesting with what we as people cut out, and sometimes subconsciously. What we cut out isn't the, like, eighth work trip, And what we cut out isn't the third extracurricular activity for our fourth grader. Instead, oftentimes what we start to cut out is our relationships. It's people, right? You can see this when you're driving down the highway as you're trying to accomplish your list. All of a sudden, anybody who is in your way, who is in your path, is an obstacle to you achieving what you're trying to do. And so we dangerously swerve past the people. Or you're trying to go grocery shopping, and you get to the line, particularly the line at Harris Teeter, and you see that it is about 20 people deep with one person on the cash register. All of those people are an obstacle to you getting this thing done. They are the problem, and they need to be cut out. Or you are trying to pick someone up or drop somebody something off, And you need to get it done quickly because this is like number seven in a list of 26. And so what we do is we put these blinders on and we just run in, do the thing, and we're like, don't look at me, I'm not here. I don't have time to stop and talk with you. I don't have time, pleasantries, interactions. No, I don't care if I know you or not. We ain't talking. 
We cut these people out. Now, sometimes we cut out random people, but sometimes we also cut out the people who are closest to us, right? Like, we start cutting family dinners. Uh, Here's chicken nuggets. Just do it in front of the TV. I got to do this other thing. Sometimes we start demoting our date nights. They're just not a priority. They're not really that important. Other times we postpone and postpone and postpone those intimate gatherings with close friends that linger long into the night. Well, we don't have time for that, and we haven't for years. Sometimes what happens is we cut short and excuse ourselves from nighttime cuddles with our kids. And other times, we will go an entire lifetime without connecting to God and allowing our Father to speak truth and life and love to us. Now, I'm not immune from any of these things because actually most of these examples are from my own life. (laughs) In fact, a couple uh, weeks ago, days ago, I created a list of the things that I had to accomplish that day. I mean, they were due by midnight that day. And I made the list, and I basically created how many hours it was going to take me to complete each of these things that needed to be done. And I was pretty generous, like, that I was going to be fully productive and, like, really stay on task, and the Facebook browser wasn't going to get opened at all. Like, I am going to do this, right? It was going to take me 13 hours to complete all of these things. I had six. And so what did I do? I called Zach and told him, hey, I'm not coming home tonight. <laughs> I'm going to stay here. I'm going to work on this. I'm going to hash this thing out. Right? These are the things we cut our emotional well-being. We cut our social well-being. We cut our spiritual well-being all for the sake of progress. And maybe, maybe, maybe we accomplished like, a lot of stuff. Like Maybe we do. I'm not completely sure that's true. But what it actually does result in is a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of pain. And I don't mean like I feel guilty for not being with my kids at night. Not that kind of guilty pain, I feel bad. I'm talking real, serious pain, measurable pain. We experience like the pain of all this pursuit of progress in these physical, real ways, right? We get stomach aches and stomach ulcers, We get migraine headaches that drive us crazy. Our back tenses up like this. I'm fine. I just, I'm a little tight today. Didn't stretch, right? We wind up with high blood pressure. All of these things leading to more and more debilitating problems and illnesses. But it's not just physical pain that we experience. We also experience emotional pain. Right? We experience this deep resentment that wells up inside of us. That, that is uh, pointed towards anyone that is causing us more work. So whether we love our job and we love our family, the fact that they are responsible for the overloadedness that we feel, I resent you. But it also can play out in hostility. Sometimes resentment, sometimes hostility that we get hostile and angry and we blame all of the people in our lives or all of the things in our lives that are causing us all this pain, that are causing us to feel this overloaded weight. And it happens in mental ways too. Like we experience mental pain. Sometimes we experience depression. It's like this hostility that we don't blame outward on other people. It's this hostility that we blame ourselves in. We become like hostile to ourselves saying, I can't believe that I couldn't live up to all of the expectations. I can't believe that I couldn't live up to my expectations and their expectations. And so it causes this fog and this gloom to come upon us and to weigh us down so heavy. It can also result in anxiety, this fear and this worry about all of the things. What if I don't accomplish everything? What if all of these pieces don't happen? And it can also cause us spiritual pain. Our minds begin to feel and our bodies begin to feel meaningless and purposeless, that we feel disconnected and hopeless about this whole entire world and all of our life. This is real pain that we experience. And sometimes we try to explain it away in all these other ways. We say, oh, no, 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 I just, like, I haven't drunk enough caffeine. And so, like, if I have more caffeine, my migraine headache will go away. Okay, maybe. 
Or maybe it's that we are totally and completely overloaded. Maybe it's because we are living these marginless lives that are just slaves to pursuing more and more progress. Now this pain, as much as, like I don't want anybody to experience pain, I don't want to experience pain, sometimes this pain can actually be our ally. And I don't mean it in like a, like, like don't get an epidural during childbirth because like embrace the pain. I don't mean it in that way. Uh, epidural two times. What I mean is sometimes pain can be sort of this like signal to us that something is wrong. It can be this indicator that like, hey, you've gone too far. You're doing too much. Stop. Pay attention. It's this reminder to fix what is going on, to, 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 to something is wrong. You've gone too far. And in this case, sometimes it's this indicator that we've pursued progress too far and we need something else. What we need is love. And I don't mean this in like a all you need is love sort of Beatles way. I mean this love in something so much bigger. So you remember that part about how progress is really good at like economy and it's really good at technology and so, but the places it's not so good is like relationships, emotions, and soul care. That is love. That is the places where we can know love, where we engage and connect with our friends and our family and our God. See, the guy who wrote the book, Swanson, he has this quote. He says this, to have accepted the love of God is to be armed and disarmed at the same time. This is a love that cannot rightly be kept in. It is bursting, it is a bursting out love. In its spilling out, it binds to others. And when it binds to others, it heals. It knits hearts, it builds community, and it brings everything together in perfect unity. Love is the only medicine I know of which, when used according to direction, heals completely. His whole premise is this idea that when we experience this pain of pursuing progress, the only thing that can combat it is love that is found in margins. Now, think about this for a second. When, when God looked down on earth and he saw sort of like the pain that was existing in humanity, he didn't say, hey, they need more technology. He didn't look at that and say, hey, they need more governmental programs to take care of that. He didn't say, hey, more education will fix all of those things. What God said was, they need love. They need the embodiment and incarnation of a love of a God who is unfathomable. And so God sent down his son Jesus so that we could experience and know what love fully lived out looks like. And the result of that was, was a God embodied in flesh and blood who died for us and then came back to life so that we could have hope so that we could experience love. And that when we experience this love, it's not a love that we keep in. It's a love that fills us and overflows us to the point that we begin to embody that love for others to experience. We begin to love other people in this supernatural way. But this love can only be experienced, we can only know it in the margins. We can't be running like this knowing love. It's not going to happen because you can't be still enough to know love. Love happens in the white spaces. It happens in the margins. It happens in the space between our loads and our limits. It happens in the places where we can stand back and look at life and say, that's where I was loved. That's where I see God. That's where I see my community. And if we are constantly loading ourselves up and bearing this deep burden that is beyond our capacity, we cannot know that love. There's no space for it to exist in. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, the writer, his name is Paul, he actually talks about this idea of love. And, and really when you read it, it is only a love that can be experienced in the margins. 
It's not a love that can be rushed about. It's not a love that can be experienced through pursuit of progress. It's a love that can only be experienced in the margin. He talks about living a life that is compelled by love, not measured by progress or accomplishments, but to look at the quality of our relationships and the quality of our love. And so we're going to read that. This is the beginning part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, Paul, when he wrote this, he was actually writing a letter to a church at Corinth. This is why it's called 1 Corinthians, right? It's the, one, of the, one of the letters that was written to the Corinthians church or the Corinthians. Now, when Paul was writing this letter, the issue that Paul was addressing was something that we are not addressing today. In fact, it's not necessarily something that we're dealing with today. The things that he was dealing with was there was this huge argument in the church about how to use gifts, particularly gifts of prophecy and gifts of tongues. It was this argument in the church of like how do we boast well and when are we being too selfish and too envious of each other. And so that's why some of those things are in there, the gifts of tongues if you speak with the tongues of men and angers, if, if you can prophesy well, like all of these things, but you don't love, you're nothing. Now, again, that's not the issue that we're addressing here. Instead, the issue we're addressing here is this marginal living, marginless living, this pursuit of progress. So what I wanted to do, and don't think I'm being blasphemous, I wanted to rewrite this passage. Based on what Paul was trying to communicate to that church, I rewrote it based on what we're dealing with. And so this maybe is how it might have gone. If I have earned enough money to make me feel financially secure, or if I have accomplished enough to earn attention and accolades from my boss, if I've finished everything on my to-do list, but I do not have love, I'm just being annoying. If I have ever earned every degree in higher education offers, if I have all of Netflix watched, If I have earned enough power to command all of my people and I have organized all of my possessions to the exact location they should be, but I do not have love, I am an idiot. If I have given all of my time to the PTA, to church, to the neighbors, to every request of my children and grandchildren, If I have given all of my emotional energy to my friends and family, all of my resources are poured out to those who need them. If I give and serve and drain myself until I have not slept, until my calendar is overloaded, until I have met every expectation and engaged in every social pleasantry, but I have not loved, there is no progress to be found. Paul continues in chapter 13 this way. He says, love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And perhaps Paul would have said what's happening today, something like this. Love doesn't rush. Love doesn't ignore others. It does not throw you into anxiety about the future. It does not envy or resent others for, the length, for lengthening your to-do list. It does not boast on how much has been accomplished. Love does not dishonor others, but it seeks and does not seek self-accomplishment. It does not blame others with hostility for being overwhelmed. It does not constantly uh, replay failed expectations. Love doesn't throw you into depression for not being good enough or not accomplishing enough. Love does not delight in evil but always rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never 
fails. But where there are visions of fear and anxiety about what will happen if you don't accomplish more in love, they are stopped. Where there are voices demanding you to take on more beyond your limits, in love, they are silenced. Where there is a never-ending pile of things to know and to learn and become better at, they won't take you nearly as far as love will. When we allow ourselves to sacrifice love for the sake of progress, no progress actually comes. But in margin, in creating space for us to engage with each other and with God, creating space for us to experience and know love, we will experience love and life, and that love will never fail. We'll experience this abundant life that God actually called us to and created us for. There's this quote by this guy named William Wilberforce, and he actually was fighting for the end of slavery in England. And one of the things he wanted to do was in order to do that, one of the arguments was, well, hold on a second, like, slavery actually helps us progress. Demoralizing and demoting people actually helps us advance. And Wilberforce was like, hold on a second, then we need to completely redefine what we mean by progress, because that's not going to cut it. And so Wilberforce stood forward and he made this statement. He said, above all, Measure your progress by your experience of the love of God and its exercise before men. His whole point was we can't keep forsaking ourselves and other people and our relationship with God in efforts to try to progress more and more and more. We've got to redefine how we understand progress. It's, we've got to understand that progress will only really happen in the margins in the places where we can know and experience love, love for each other and love for God. So I have another question for you this morning, but this time you're not going to have to talk to anybody. Your other question this morning that I want you to think of is how is your life progressing? How is your life progressing? Is your life progressing in the quality of relationships that you have? and in the depth of love that you experience from God, to God, and for each other? If that's you today, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you would continue to find ways to create margin for that to grow and for you to live in that abundancy of life and love. Or, is your life progressing in the way of economy and education and technology? Is your life being so filled with entertainment and accomplishments, but you are experiencing a tremendous amount of pain? Today, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you would be emboldened to find the spaces to create margin in your life that you would experience deep love. And I believe that that love can only be experienced by first connecting to the source of love, who is God. And perhaps today, this may be your um, 100th time that you are coming back to the feet of Jesus and saying, yeah, I, I've pursued something else other than your plan for me. I've pursued something else other than your sustaining love. Or maybe this is your very first time ever today that you've kind of awakened to this idea that maybe you need God. Maybe you desire God's love. Maybe you want to build your life a little bit differently than it has been built in the past. And I want to pray that that happens for you today, too. We're going to sing a song, and as we sing together, I want to invite you, whether, whether you're in that first category or the second category where you're making a first-time decision, or you're, making, you're in that category, but this is like your 100th time to come back to God and say, yep, I need you even more. I want to invite you to sing this song that maybe today 
you would be awakened to the call to build your life differently, to build a life that is not based on progress and accomplishments and what you can consume and do more of, but that you would find a firm foundation in the love of God, that you would trust him to be the one to speak truth to you, to be enough, to love you enough to lead you to love those around you. Will you pray with me? Father God, I know that for me this is a hard message. And so I imagine that maybe for others in the room it is also a challenge. Father, I ask that you would create inroads into our hearts and minds that we would not be crushed by this challenge. But instead we would be excited. We would be set free we would run into your arms, that we would cry out to you, God, we need you to be the one who builds a new life, who helps us build on a totally new foundation. Father, would you allow us in these moments this morning to experience your love? Father, that we would be able to let go of all of those voices inside of us that say, that all of our worth and all of our value is based on what we can make and what we can do and what we can accomplish. You would allow us to let go of all of that and create even space just this morning that we could experience your love and your life. We pray all these things.